Good morning, and welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday after the Epiphany. My name is Pastor Seth Novak, and on behalf of the entire community of Anu Stay Lutheran Church, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a worship bulletin with the order of service from the link in the video description below. Before we continue, uh, we'd like to take a moment to share prayer concerns from our community. If you have any prayer concerns, uh, joys, or sorrows that you would like to share, I invite you to put them in the chat or the comments now, being mindful of privacy in this public space. At this time, I'll lift up um, our, a member of our congregation, uh, Martha, who was diagnosed this a uh, couple weeks ago with ovarian cancer. Uh, she started her uh, chemo treatments this week and so is recovering from that. We pray for health and comfort for Martha uh, as she starts down this road to recovery. And he, she wanted me to let everybody know too that um, calls, or excuse me, um, emails and uh, cards are welcome. With that, I'll invite you to turn to your bulletin as we begin our worship. We gather in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your Spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
Let us pray. Everlasting God, you give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Make us agents of your healing and wholeness, so that your good news may be made known to the ends of your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our lesson today is from 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting. For an obligation has been laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights to the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became one under the law, though I myself am not, not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law so that I may win those outside the law. To the weak, I am weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share its blessings. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. As soon as Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, for they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's one image in this story that's always bothered me. When Jesus and the others come to the house, Simon's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever, presumably very ill. Jesus heals her. And what does she do immediately? She gets up and she starts serving them. Some translations even have her waiting tables. It always seemed to me kind of sexist or maybe even misogynist that this poor woman would be expected or obligated to get back to work right after being so sick. But there's a detail that's missing in your English translation of the Bible. In Greek, like in English, there are several different words that can mean to serve. One of them comes from the same root as the Greek word for servant or slave, which would make sense, right? <clears throat> that word means the kind of menial labor that I imagine when I hear this story. Waiting tables, tidying up the house, dusting. And that's what upsets me when I hear this, that this, this woman would feel this need to pour herself into this work for her male guests when only moments before she'd been laid flat with a fever. But that's not the verb that this story uses. It uses a different word, the word diakoneo, which is the English, excuse me, the, the root of our English word deacon. 
It means to serve, yeah, but it can also mean to minister. Instead of menial labor, it has the connotation of sharing or participating in work. The labor itself could be menial, but the spirit in which it's done is not, an is not a spirit of obligation or humiliation, but out of solidarity. When the apostles in the book of Acts were overwhelmed with the task of not only preaching the gospel, but then also distributing bread to the widows, they appointed seven deacons to help with the work, to help with the serving, the diaconeo. <clears throat> it wasn't that the work of distributing bread to the widows was beneath them, far from it. It was that that work was too much for them. They needed help. These, dirt, these deacons served alongside the apostles, doing a job that was just as important, but which needed more hands and a different set of skills. Several of those deacons, by the way, went on to do grand things, like Philip, who baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, or Stephen, who preached the gospel even as he, as he was being stoned to death. Simon's mother-in-law wasn't waiting tables. She's serving alongside Jesus and his disciples. Jesus finds her prostrate in the throes of a fever, and he heals her by lifting her up by raising her to a place of power and health where she has agency and authority. And then she serves them like they just served her. It's an act of mutual and equitable compassion. And I can't help but wonder if this peculiar and prominent detail about Simon's mother-in-law is intended by Mark as a story about what Jesus does for us. Jesus finds us bent low and weighed down, laid flat and sickened by the effects of sin on our world. And he raises us up so that we can join him and continue his work of proclaiming the message of God's kingdom and casting out the demons that afflict us. I notice the progression of this story. First, Jesus casts out one demon in the synagogue and heals one woman in the house. Then the whole town congregates outside the door where he casts out many demons and heals many diseases. And from there he goes to all the towns, casting out demons and healing the sick. That's a lot of work for one person. He needs some help, some deacons. It's this work, this service or ministry that he has been called to do and in which we also have been invited to participate. Now, in these past few weeks, we've been talking about call, about vocation, and how, to, how we discern it, how to determine where God is calling us next. This story invites us to ask ourselves how God is inviting us to serve as we have been served, how to respond to the healing touch of Jesus who brings us the good news of abundant life. How are we as the church to respond? What role can we play in the healing of our nation of our culture, of our world? Well, friends, that's exactly the question we're going to dig into today. Following this worship service, we're going to have a conversation in which we seek to deepen our understanding about how the church can best serve a society that is, so, that is already so divided and becoming more so every day. The question is, do we best serve our neighbors by being a community where we can all leave our differences at the door? And come together over common ground? Perhaps it's best for the church to steer clear of politics and potentially divisive issues entirely so that we can be a nursery for community. Maybe the best way we can create healing is to be a neutral ground, a sanctuary or a refuge. Perhaps then those relationships that we begin to build here can be the ties that bind us together in the public sphere the nuclei of healing in our fractured world. Of course, how deep can those relationships be if we're not bringing our whole selves to them? If we're avoiding controversy and division, are we really contributing to the health and the health of our communities? Maybe it would be better for the church to be a safe place to exchange and discuss those ideas, a place where we can openly state our opinions without fear of judgment where we can listen 
to opposing arguments without feeling the need to defend or correct. Could that be the best way we can serve? Can the church be the big tent where all perspectives and opinions are welcomes and welcomed and respected? If the church takes on that role of being a mediator and a bridge builder, though, where do we draw the line? What happens when we encounter perspectives that are incompatible with God's kingdom? White nationalism cannot exist alongside racial equity. Bigotry can't hold hands with compassion. Maybe God's call to the church is to reclaim its place as the conscience of society, the voice proclaiming loudly and consistently the holiness and morality of God. Perhaps the best way we can serve is to take an unyielding position on what is right and wrong. But then how do we determine that? How can we be sure that we're speaking for God and not just for ourselves? Although there are many ways for the church to respond to this question of bringing healing to division, these three perspectives are the ones we're going to be looking at particularly today. There may be room in the larger church for all three of these perspectives. But unlike St. Paul, we as individuals and congregations are not generally able to be all things to all people, are we? But that's the strength of the church together. Although we can only be who we are individually, together the church can be all things to all people because the church has room for all people. And that's God's gift to us, that God calls each of us as we are into this community to be who we are, who God has created us to be. And together we fit into this larger cosmopolitan community of believers. What this means for us is that our task is to figure out who God has created us to be. Are we a community of refuge, a community of mediation, a community of, with a prophetic voice? How has God called and equipped this congregation and the people in it to address this issue? That's the question we're going to explore today. We're not going to find the answer in a single hour. But I hope and I expect that we will be able to do some good processing and thinking about how we might continue to seek that answer faithfully and with God's help. I can tell you that no matter what, we are not called to be a community lying down. Like Simon's mother-in-law, Jesus shows up in this story, walking into our houses and taking us by the hand to raise us to new health and new life. With this gift of wholeness, we too are invited to serve as we have been served, to love as we have been loved. Our life and our ministry, our diaconia, together in this community, is one way that we can do that. But it's not the only way. Even as we join together in this conversation about who our community can be together, we're also invited to consider and to contemplate who God is calling and equipping each of us to be in our own lives, our own families, our own contexts. Are you that person who is always safe? Are you a mediator who brings different people together? Or a prophet who proclaims the way? How is God calling you to respond to the other issues and the perils of this world, things like racism and climate change or birth control and gun control? What does it mean for you as a person of faith to be navigating these issues? What's your role in this? It's my hope that by practicing this process together, we might all be better equipped to take on this task in our own lives. And so I hope you'll stick around after this today and join us because I wonder if this discuss discussion today can be one way, perhaps one way among many, that Jesus is reaching out to take each of us by the hand, to raise us up to that work, to that service of our own ministry.
as we by love for love were made. Your living likeness still we bear, though more dishonored, disobeyed. We come with all our heart and mind, your call to hear, your love to find. We come with self-inflicted pains of broken trust and chosen wrong, half free, half bound by inner chains, by social forces swept along, by powers and systems close confined, yet seeking hope for humankind. Great God in Christ, you set us free, your life to live, your joy to share. Give us your Spirit's liberty to turn from guilt and all despair, and offer all that faith can do. We come now to a time of prayer, which is the expression of people's feelings and concerns and joys and sorrows as well. So I invite you to participate in these prayer petitions and between them invite you also to put special concerns as part of the prayer. So with the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, let us, for those in need, and for all, then, of God's creation. We pray today for the whole church, for its ministry and its many ministries, and for the missions of the gospel all over the world. We pray also for the wholeness of creation, for all that God has given to us in this marvelous world. We pray also this day for peace and for justice in this world. We pray for nations and those that are in authority and for our own local community as well. We pray also for our own country in this time of transition and turmoil, praying for peace and wholeness of life. We pray for the poor, for the oppressed, for the sick, for the bereaved, for the lonely, for those people that we name as well out loud in our own living space. We pray for Agnes Day Lutheran Church and for the people that are closest to us. We pray also for the faithful departed, those who have been special blessings in our lives in the past and who, whose memories still inspire us. So these prayers we speak and these prayers we think and these prayers we offer. Into your hands, O gracious God, we commend then all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. When we were in darkness, the light of the world came into our midst. The feast and the season of Epiphany celebrate the coming of this light among us in the person of Jesus, who shows us the way of abundant life. One of the ways we experience and continue to share that abundant life is through the ministries of this congregation. As members and friends of Agnus Day, we gather to support one another in loving community. We worship together in the hope of healing for this pandemic and beyond. 
and we lift up our neighbors through programs like the Fish Food Bank, Food Backpacks for Kids, and the Peninsula Gig Harbor Homelessness Coalition. And we, nurture, we nurture the faith of Christians of all ages through forums and Sunday school and confirmation classes. All of this and so many other programs are made possible by your contributions to Anya's Day and its outreach. If you'd like to join me in making sure that these and other ministries continue to grow and thrive in this time of pandemic, I invite you to follow the link in the video description below where you can make a one-time donation or set up a recurring gift on you stay. Thank you for your dedication to this community and to this work. At this time, I invite you to prepare both your heart and your table for the Holy Eucharist. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, creator of heaven and earth. You rescued your covenant people, led them on all their journeys and taught them by the prophets. You so loved the world that you gave your only son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he'd given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit in this meal and make us one in this community of faith with all your people throughout the world. Glory and praise to you, O God, author of life, word made flesh, 
power of the Most High, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you're not receiving the meal this morning, receive this blessing. May the healing presence of Jesus be near you always. Amen. If you are receiving the meal this morning, hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is eternal. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet nourished in body and in spirit to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Before we conclude today, I'd like to share just a few announcements. The first is that following our worship service this morning at 1030, uh, you're invited to gather for a Zoom forum discussion on our sermon topic for today. We'll ponder the question, what is the church's role in a divided society? Using a deliberative process that I hope will allow us to not only learn more about the topic, but also about ourselves as a congregation. I will take what we learn from our discussion today as the basis for my sermon next week, so I hope you can participate. Then coming up on February 17th, we'll be gathering for Ash Wednesday worship uh, on YouTube at 7 p.m. Our midweek Lenten services will be offered 
uh, in those weeks following, beginning on March, February 24th. And they'll be offered twice a day, once at 11 a.m. and once at 7 p.m. Uh, so you can show up at whatever time best fits your schedule. At both times, we'll be gathering on Zoom with St. John's Episcopal here in town for a pre-recorded worship service and presentation, followed by a live discussion. The theme for our gatherings this year is Saints for Today. Each week, we'll learn about a different saint from Christ's church and how they lived out the gospel, excuse me, lived out the kingdom of God with conviction, while also showing grace and compassion to their adversaries. We hope to learn from this great cloud of witnesses how we maybe can address and heal some of the divisiveness in our society and within our own families today. Father Eric Stell and I will be taking turns leading the presentations and discussions. So please mark your calendars for February 24th through March 24th at either 11 a.m. or 7 p.m. and plan to join us if you can. Finally, just a reminder that we do still have plenty of hymnals available for uh, loan. If you're interested, just call or email the church office and we can arrange a time for you to come sign one out or we can figure out how to get one to you if you, if you can't come to us. These are a great resource to have at home. Not only are they full of lots of favorite hymns, uh, they also have orders of service for uh, morning, evening, and night prayer, as well as a daily lectionary of Bible readings for your devotional, to guide you in your devotions, the entire book of Psalms, Martin Luther's small catechism for devotional use, and um, all manner of prayers for a wide variety of occasions. As we look forward to Lent, it might prove uh, a useful tool depending on what your spiritual practice is. <clears throat> Once again, thank you for being a part of, our, of this worship service today. If you found today's service meaningful, I invite you to please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Uh, you can gather right here with Anu's Day for worship every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. I'd also like to invite you to make Anu's Day a part of your week. On Wednesday, the weekly text study will be meeting at 10 a.m to look at the lessons for the coming Sunday, and the Knitters group will meet at 1.30 p.m. You can find links to these Zoom gatherings and other activities happening uh, within our congregation under the Events tab on our website, onustaylutheran.org. Go now in peace. Share the light of Christ. Amen. I'd like to invite you to share the peace of Christ with someone you know with a call or a text or an email uh, or by sharing this worship service on your social media page so that you can worship together. God bless you in your week.